and uh, I will I will always remember you guys. I will always remember this season of my life um, in ministry, and um, I'm always <laughs> I'm always going to cherish it. Um, Emma and I, we, we say, all the, honestly, all the time, we say over and over again how much we just wish we could, like, pack you all up with us and take you wherever we go. Um, we love you, and we're, we're not going to, we're not going to forget you guys, and um, you guys have meant a lot to us. Usually, I'm the crier, um, but uh, let's get into the word. We're going to be in Luke 19. Uh, we're going to read verses 1 through 10. It says that he entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up a sycamore fig tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and came and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Let's open up in a word of prayer. Father God, I want to thank you, Lord, for everybody that's here this morning. I want to thank you, God, for this church. Thank you, Lord, for your word, and we pray, God, that you just speak to us this morning, that you would encourage us, that you would build us up, and that you would uh, make us more like you. Let us hear from you today, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. This last week, uh, about a week ago, not this last Thursday, but the Thursday before, two Thursdays ago, uh, me and my dad, uh, we went on a little vacation together uh, to Jackson Hole, Wyoming. If you ever get the chance to do that, do it. I don't say that about everywhere I go. If you ever get a chance to go hike the Appalachian Trail on the West Coast, pass on that. That's not fun. It's just dis disease infested. If you ever get a ch chance to go to Jackson Hole, Wyoming, you need to do that. I mean, it's like probably like 65 or 70 there. No humidity. It's beautiful. Tons of fun things to do. But... Uh, so me and my dad, went, we went out there on Thursday, and then on Sunday, uh, Emma, my mom, and my sister, and my nephew came out and joined us, and, and then we stayed a few more days until Thursday. And so me and my dad were there for, for about a week total. And uh, before they had gotten out there, um, one day I, I was having a conversation with this, with this lady, and, um, you know, I was asking her about, you know, who, you know, where she's from, what she does, why she, you know, chose that line of profession, et cetera, et cetera. And finally in the conversation, you know, she, she started to inquire about me, and she says, uh, so what do you do? And I said, uh, well, you know, I'm, I'm a pastor, and she says, really? <laughs> These conversations, you know, I've had a few of them now. They can go multiple ways. You know, sometimes it's a good opportunity where I get to share my faith and talk about Jesus. Sometimes, you know, they're kind of just turned off and the conversation just ends. Sometimes, honestly, it can get a little awkward. Um, but she says, really? Well, yeah. And uh, she says, huh. She says, you don't really hear that very often. And I thought... Uh, yeah, I guess not. I mean, I didn't know really what to say. Um, and she says, uh, why, did you, why did you want to be a pastor? 
She says, uh, were you like some kind of choir boy? <laughs> At that moment, I started to wonder if she actually knew what a pastor was. <laughs> choir boy? I don't know what that is. I don't know what that means. It was an awkward conversation. Um, she clearly wasn't a Christian, but that's okay. But I thought she asked a good question. She asked me, why are you a pastor? As I was, you know, we actually just accepted this new position just a few days ago. Um, and, and as I was contemplating, okay, I've got one more time with the people of Mountain City. What do I want to talk to them about? If I have one more chance to speak to those people, what am I, you know, I've got an entire book full of scripture that I can talk to them about. What am I going to, what's going to be the last thing that I want to speak to them on? And um, I decided that, that the best thing that I could do, that the thing that I wanted to end my time with you on is, is I want to talk to you about that question of why. And I want to ask everybody here this morning, why are you here? Why does this church exist? Why are you a Christian? Why did you show up this morning? Why? I think that in order for us to discover as a group what our why is, we have to understand what Jesus' why was and is today. In this text, we see a specific person by the name of Zacchaeus, and he's a chief tax collector. He's, he's, he's extremely wealthy. He's a sinner, and he's, he's hated by everybody because he's, he's a thief and he's a thug. He's gotten rich by stealing from other people. And it says that Zacchaeus, he, he wanted to see who Jesus was. He had heard about Jesus, and maybe he, he wondered, I wonder if he can heal the brokenness that's in me. I wonder if Jesus can do for me what I've heard that he's done for other people. And he had this curiosity about, about seeing who is, who is this Jesus that everybody's talking about and that everybody's following. What Zacchaeus didn't know, though, is that, is that Jesus, he wanted to see him. That he had intentions of meeting him. Jesus had intentions of what he wanted to do in and through Zacchaeus. So J Jesus comes to the tree and he looks up and he says, Zacchaeus, come down for I must, I must stay at your house. I must come have dinner with you. It wasn't a, yeah, I might, what do you think? No, he said I must. It was important. It was critical to Jesus that he encountered Zacchaeus. Why? Because Zacchaeus was lost. I think that it's important that we, we know and we realize that Jesus placed importance on individuals with names and with stories. See, a lot of times, I think that in, in churches all around, you know, we, we think, well, you know, we're reaching this many people. And that's good, you know, we, we, we want to reach people. And there's, there's some churches and uh, you know, cities that, that reach more than others. And let's just talk about Kansas City, for example. You know, in Kansas City, there's no doubt, you know, a few churches in that city that are probably what are considered mega churches, which is 2,000 people or more. And they're reaching a lot of people. But the truth is, is there's still hundreds of thousands of people in Kansas City that don't know Jesus. And God, Jesus, is not satisfied with winning back 25% of his kids, or 50%, or 75%. No, it says that the Lord is not willing that any should perish. He leaves the 99 and he goes after the one. Jesus is concerned with individuals with real names and real stories and real identities. And his why was that he came to seek and to save those who were lost. Right from the beginning in the book of Genesis, we read of this descendant, you know, this, this 
the seed that would, that would come and that would redeem and reconcile and restore mankind to God. This was the purpose that God had from the very beginning. That the great work of God would come through Jesus Christ and He would, re, he would reconcile, He would restore the effects of sin that came through Adam. And I think that a, a big part of the reason why churches fail, why many pastors aren't spending time in prayer, why many churches aren't generous in their giving, is because they've either forgotten their why or they've never known it in the first place. As I was thinking about this message, I thought about something that I, that I kind of have learned along the way. There have been four times in my life that I can vividly remember where I gave far beyond what I could afford, where I gave way more money than I had or could afford to give. Four times where I can just vividly remember I gave a ridiculous amount of money to a church that I was not able to give financially. And I didn't do it because I was super generous. That wasn't why I did it. I promise. I'm not telling you this because I want to tell you how generous I am. I didn't do it because I was generous. As I thought back to these four instances, the, the four instances were three times I did it. It was for a church building campaign. One time I did it was for a missions campaign where they were raising money for missions. And as I reflected back and I thought back to all these four instances, I realized that the reason I did it those times and I had in others was because I had a very big why. It's because on those Sundays, I was convinced that if I didn't do it, that people were going to go to hell. That people wouldn't hear the name of Jesus. That it was worth sacrificing my personal comfort, my personal finances, so that others could hear the name of Jesus. The only reason I did it was because I had a big enough why. And so it compelled me to give way more than I had to give. A couple years ago, I got, uh, I got invited to go preach at the bridge. And it was before I was on staff there, and they just invited me up as a guest speaker. And they were making their way through a series called Courageous. And, uh, and I'd actually preached there once before in that series. It was about a 12-week series or so. And, and I preached on courageous worship and and they invited me to come up again, so I, this time I decided to preach on courageous giving. And so, I, uh, you know, I, I, I grew up in church, and I'd, I'd heard many people talk about giving before and money and finances. But every time that I'd heard a, a preacher or a pastor talk about it, they'd always kind of talked on it from the perspective of, you know, God commands it. You know, Malachi 3.10, if you do it, God will bless you. He'll take care of your finances. He'll, he'll provide for you. I decided this time, though, I was going to take a little bit of a different approach. I decided that this time I was going to preach on courageous giving from the perspective of we give so that others can know Jesus because other people's lives are at stake. People's destinies are at stake. And so I went through my message and, and, I, and I, I told the people, I said, we give because if you don't give, people aren't going to have hope. People are going to go to an eternity in hell. People aren't ever going to know the name of Jesus. People aren't going to have their lives restored. People aren't going to have their marriages healed. So the next day, I show up to the, I show up and uh, I'm talking to one of the people from the church, and they come to me and they say, "Hey, we had our biggest giving Sunday yesterday. It wasn't because I was a great orator. It was because I gave them a bigger why." It's because I told them, if you don't give, people aren't going to hear the name of Jesus. People aren't going to encounter God and have their lives changed. We have to have a big enough why that we don't care about our personal comfort. We don't care about our personal convenience. 
The reason people don't pray is because they don't have a strong enough why. People in our churches don't pray because they haven't been convinced that it matters or that God hears them or that they're going to hear from God. Oftentimes, the place we start with is how do we do something, not why. And it's not that the how isn't important. The how is important, but it's not as important as the why. The why is what fuels our how. I've asked this question so many times, and I've, I've heard other people ask the question so many times. You know, um, how do you prepare a great sermon? I've Googled that. How do you... Uh, how do you become a good speaker? How do you build a church? How do you recruit volunteers? How do you get your church to give more? You know, how, how, how? And sometimes our why can be very small. You know, sometimes we'll say, you know, how do you do this because, um, you know, I want to be a good orator, or we want to have a church that's bigger than the guy down the street, or we're tired of doing everything ourselves, so we need to recruit more volunteers. Or, we're just trying to keep the lights on and pay the salaries. And these are all very small whys. We need a why that's going to fuel our how. Whenever you don't know how to do something, give a big enough why and you will instantly become more innovative. You put enough pressure on somebody and they're going to figure out how to do it. But we've got to remember what our why is as a church. Or sometimes, you know, we have a why, but it's so small that it doesn't get us out of bed. It doesn't get us on our knees. It doesn't inspire. It doesn't motivate. If your why is too small or too shallow, it's not going to fuel your how. Now think about this. How did Jesus go through what he went through? How did he accomplish what he did? How did he climb upon that cross and not take himself down until it was finished? Because he had a big enough why. He knew why he was doing it. But do we? Why do some churches succeed, some organizations see, succeed, some businesses succeed, and some don't? It's because I think they either have a big enough why or they don't. You know, have you ever found yourself asking the question, why am I doing this? I have. There have been plenty of times in my life where I'm like, why am I doing this? And it's usually whenever you start to ask yourself, why am I doing this, to where you're going to stop doing it with excellence, or you're going to stop doing it altogether. Jesus said in verse 10, he came to seek and to save the lost. On February 11th, 1990, some of you will probably remember this. Others of you probably won't know what I'm talking about. But Buster Douglas fought Mike Tyson. And it was, it was in Tokyo. It was 10 rounds. And the fight would go down as one of the biggest upsets in history. The undefeated, undisputed Mike Tyson was about to fight Buster Douglas, who was an underdog with four losses and a draw to his name at the time. Buster Douglas got knocked out by Mike Tyson, and he, he goes down on the canvas, and, and they're like, it's over. And he's, he's like out of it. He's stammering, he's climbing up on his hands and knees, and he's, he's trying to get up, and he's stumbling, and they're like, it's over. You know, and the countdown's going, and five, four, three, two, ding, ding, ding. He gets saved by the bell. The round is over. And so Buster Douglas climbs up in his corner, and Everybody's like, they know what's going to happen. The next round's going to come, and they're like, Tyson's going to come out, and he's just going to hammer on him because he's, he's, he's there. He's, he's ready to just knock him out. And that's exactly what happened. The next round started, and Mike Tyson, he came out swinging. I mean, he was pinning him up against the ropes. He was doing everything he could to knock Buster Douglas out. But something happened that nobody expected to happen. Buster Douglas started fighting back. He started fighting back. And then the unthinkable happened. Buster Douglas knocked Mike Tyson out. He knocked him down, and he didn't get up. It was, the, it was this 
massive upset. Nobody could believe it. So all the reporters, you know, they go to Buster Douglas after the, after the, after the match, and they're like, what happened? And Buster Douglas said, it's actually really simple. He said, uh, before my mom died, she told the world that I was going to beat Mike Tyson. Buster Douglas's mom died two days before the fight. And so he said, whenever I was laying on the canvas, I had this thought, and I decided I can either stay down and I can die with my mom, or I can get up and I can live for her. He said, I can either make my mom a liar, or I can make her a prophet. So he said, I got up and I fought. You see, Buster Douglas, he had a why that was bigger than Mike Tyson's punch. If our churches don't have a big enough why, we're going to lose the battle. Because we've got our own personal enemy that's trying to knock us out. The devil is trying to kill every single church that he can. He's trying to take out pastors. He's trying to take out congregations. He's trying just to knock churches out. And if you and I, if we don't have a big enough why, we're going to lose the battle every day. If you and I, if we don't have a big enough why, we're not going to do all that God has called us to do. I didn't pick this message because I thought that this specific church needed it. I picked this message because I didn't really think that there was a more important message that I could talk to any church about. I think that this church has amazing people. I think you guys are doing amazing work. But I also think that there, are, there is untapped potential here. I think that there are greater things that God wants to do through the people in this church. I think that God has bigger plans for you, that he has something more in store for you, that he wants to use you in bigger ways than you guys have ever seen yet. But if you and I, if we don't show up, people are going to go to hell for eternity. People aren't going to have a hope. Families aren't going to be healed. Relationships aren't going to be healed. Lives aren't going to be restored. If you and I don't show up, if the church doesn't show up, people are never going to know the one thing that can save them and restore them and heal them. We have the biggest why in the world. You and I just have to remember it. Paint it on your wall. Write it on your heart. Write it on a note card and put it on your mirror. If you and I aren't strong and courageous, if we don't show up, people aren't going to experience their destinies and they're never going to know the name of Jesus. We just have to remember why why we're here, why we exist. I love you guys. I love this church. I love the individuals in this church. God has great things that he wants to do through you, big things. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you, God, that you came and you sought me out. And that you saved me from my brokenness and from my sin. And you gave me hope. And you gave me life. And you gave me a purpose and a calling. And you gave me a relationship with you. And I want to thank you, God, for that same work that you've done through everybody that's in here today. God, I, I thank you, Lord, so much for your word and for your son. And that you have given us a great commission. That you have handed over your why to us. That you have entrusted us. That you have 
given us the responsibility of carrying that torch. Father, I want to thank you, Lord, for this church, for every single one of them that's in here. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would strengthen them, that you would encourage them, that you would build them up, and you would help all of us, myself included, myself most of all, to never forget what our why is, to never forget why we get on our knees and we seek your face, to never forget why we show up, to never forget what our purpose is and why we exist, why I'm here. I pray, God, that you would unite this church like never before, that you would strengthen them, Lord, and that you would just help them every single day, Lord, to remember their why, why they exist as a community of believers, and that you would strengthen them, and that you would help them to figure out the how, that you would give them wisdom and knowledge and strength for the battle, that you would help them to be strong and courageous. Send them the right man to be their pastor. Go before them every single day, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing the first verse of 772.